Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Oval Power Talks, a series of interviews which the Oval Observer Foundation conducts with some of India's foremost strategic affairs and foreign policy experts. Today I'm going to be chatting with Major General Debankar Banerjee. General Banerjee has a distinguished career of over 36 years in the Indian Army, following which he devoted his time to strategic affairs and disarmament studies. General Banerjee is one of the founding members of the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, one of India's most coveted think tanks. He has also served as the Deputy Director of IDSA and has been associated with institutes such as the Colombo-based Regional Center for Strategic Studies and the U.S. Institute of Peace, Washington. General Banerjee, thank you so much for joining us today. General Banerjee, you were a young officer in the Indian Army when the 1962 war broke out. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the legacy of the war today? Uh, what sort of impact has it had on Indian strategic thought especially vis-a-vis -vis China, and has it been a big benefit or a hindrance to our conceptualization of the relationship and threat vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, I was just uh, two years in service when the 1962 November conflict uh, began. I uh, was deployed in the forward areas and have seen the war at first hand. Then, of course, I did not participate in it because a very small section of the Indian Army was involved in the actual conflict. But subsequently, over the next 30, 40 years, I followed the war, the conflict, seen the places where the actual battles took place, and followed the elements very closely over these last few decades. Without doubt, this was the most significant geopolitical, geostrategic development for India. It defined India's politics, foreign policy, and of course, Indian strategy, till today. And so therefore it was without doubt the most significant development in these areas uh, in the history of India. Uh, the defeat in 1962 was a traumatic experience for India for several reasons. However we look at it today, it was a defeat. Notwithstanding the bravery with which the Jawans fought the odds against which they were deployed and uh, acquitted themselves with great heroism and dedication to the nation. But nothing takes away from the ultimate fact that this was a military disaster, a disaster for the nation in several areas and a very comprehensive one at that. So there are a number of lessons uh, that one can draw from this development but my major complaint is that India has never attempted to learn from the mistakes that we made in 1962. As I said, the mistakes were comprehensive, were significant. Mistakes were at the geopolitical level, the way which we analyzed the global and the situation in the northern borders and particularly developments uh, in China itself and what it meant for India. Uh, disaster in a sense that military totally unprepared for that conflict. As you know at uh, independence, there was a debate whether India should at all maintain an army. Nehru's view was, views were that uh, as we had no ill intentions towards any of our neighbors, there is no need why we should ever have a war. And therefore, what is the rationale for maintaining an army? When General Karyappa asked Mahatma Gandhi, soon before his death, the last interviews that uh, Mahatma gave, uh, Karyappa asked Mahatma Gandhi as to whether India should fight the war in Kashmir and what should be the objective and role of the army should be. Gandhi said that I'll have to think about these things very carefully while defending Kashmir is a national requirement but how the army should conduct itself uh, is an issue I will give you a reply some time later and that time never came. And so there was this uh, dual thinking whether an army was required in independent India. Of course, the JNK conflict 
in 47-49 uh, put an end to that debate. Notwithstanding our goodwill towards our neighbors and our desire to maintain excellent relations with the world and not wanting to change the status quo anyway, others may have a different view of that. And so 1962 demonstrated that uh, we were unprepared to take on China. Till the last minute, till the last minute, we were convinced, our political leadership was convinced, that notwithstanding the fact that our forces were coming in close contact with each other, at places our forces went behind the Chinese and the Chinese came behind us, but we were convinced that China will never attack India. This was a fixed perception in the political leadership. And therefore, the armies, army, Indian army went forward without clothing, without necessary weapons and equipment, ammunition, and without the wherewithals of conducting a war, and were thoroughly defeated as a consequence. That itself was a very major lesson that why the political and military elements of a nation's plans were never coordinated in order to lead to a comprehensive response to a strategic situation as adverse as it was built up to be. Militarily, we were never prepared. Our leadership, our soldiers, in terms of weapons, equipment, and in terms of tactics, we had no idea as to how to confront the Chinese. So this state of ill preparedness was a major uh, reason for our uh, military defeat. Finally, of course, the whole political question, where the border lay, how it needed to be addressed. Do all countries always fight because they are right? But there's more than one side to a question. And therefore, a resolution to problems such as this lies in finding out a compromise that safeguards one's own strategic interests as well as meets with the requirement of the opposite side. Now, the side should lose or compromise with one's vital concerns, vital requirements, and hence must secure them, but at the same time be able to find a via media resolve conflicts that they arise uh, at minimum levels of violence. And if you have to undertake violence against a neighbor or anybody else for that matter, you must be adequately prepared for it. The worst thing always and every time is to undertake a conflict without having prepared for it. You mentioned at one point that we still haven't learned the lessons of the war. If I could just zero in on that comment, uh, what are the lessons do you think we should have learned by now in terms of, let's say, the political, bureaucratic, military relationship, the structure? Why haven't we learned those lessons and what are the lessons that we need to absorb? In uh, any endeavor, uh, business, strategic, or even day-to-day -day affairs, one has to see as to where one has done the right thing and where one has done the wrong thing. And so therefore, learning the lessons from an engagement, interpersonal, human relations, or of course, supreme activities such as a war, requires a deep analysis to find out and learn the lessons of one's mistakes, and also perhaps those things that were done right. Now, one major fault in the Indian system has been that we are reluctant to accept our mistakes. We refuse to understand and learn the mistakes and therefore we cannot correct them. If we don't learn as to the mistakes that we made, we won't know what steps we should take in the future that those mistakes are not repeated. Hence, we are destined, destined unfortunately, to repeat those mistakes again and again. And a major example of this in the 62 war was the Henderson Brooks report. Henderson Brooks' report was an attempt by two senior officers of the Indian Army with extreme high credibility 
General Henderson Brooks and General Prem Bhagat, the only Victoria Cross amongst of the first Victoria Cross amongst the Indian Army and the Office Corps of the Second World War, and a very distinguished soldier. They carried out a total thorough investigation as to the reasons for the uh, setback in the 1962 war. And they came out with a fairly comprehensive report. The charter was limited. It was not to inquire into the governmental structures, political failures and such, but essentially to learn from the military mistakes in the war. But of course, when you probe the military mistakes, some of the issues and aspects of the national level mistakes uh, or the actions at uh, a higher level have to also be uh, examined. And of course, the junior level decisions, actions are quite often governed by what has been de decide decided at a higher level. So this report, till today, till today, 50 plus years later, the government of India doesn't have the confidence, doesn't have the confidence to release it to the citizens of India. So we don't know, and we're not supposed to know. We cannot know as to the mistakes that India made in 1962. Thank you for that. I mean, the Henderson Brooks report, it's, it's been a consistent demand of the public to have it released. We've had political parties who've claimed that it will be released, but it's subsequently not been released uh, nonetheless. But in your assessment, I mean, we don't have the report with us today. In your assessment, what, what was the, what, some of the major reasons and what are the lessons we could learn from it? Like, what are the changes that we could have made, uh, as, I, as I said in my previous question, to the institutional structure that would address some of the defects? Well, uh, as I said earlier, it was essentially a military lessons, uh, inquiring into the actual causes for the losses in the campaign as such overall, and of course, also in individual battles. Uh, and this was, the, in, from that sense, the crux of the report, of course, has been now released by Neville Maxwell. Uh, it was known for many years in the past. Uh, he got access to it from confidential sources from within the government of India uh, 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 domain and uh, studied that, wrote his famous book, and then, of course, uh, uh, subsequently became an expert on this so-called 1962 war. And finally, he has also released it just a few years ago. But even then, even before that, other copies of this, the essence of this was known, has been known for some time. So some issues have been uh, acted upon, uh, not as a direct consequence of the report, perhaps, but having known that these were the mistakes, so some of those things have been corrected. Now the mistakes were at several levels, and uh, there is no uh, uh, high and dry uh, mistakes like two plus two is four and cannot be five. In military, two point military strategy policy, two plus two can be four and a half, can be three and a half, uh, can sometimes be right, can sometimes be wrong. So, but there are guiding principles, the following the adoption of which is either right, historic, historically proven as being the right way of going about it, and historically perhaps been proved that that was not, or that is not the best way of going about it. So areas like political direction of the war, the command and control structures, the levels of decision making, the necessity of ensuring that troops are deployed only when there is a comprehensive strategic plan, there's adequate backing for the forces involved, that they have the right equipment and the right, right logistics support to deal with the situation, and then they continue to have the right guidance. So in all these areas and several others, uh, there were many mistakes. So you've been to China, I think, more than 30 times, uh, both in an official capacity as well as in unofficial capacities. Uh, and I'm sure that you're very well acquainted uh, with China as a result of that, both with the, some of the military officers there and otherwise. 
what in your opinion are some of the biggest misconceptions of, about China that exist uh, among the Indian public today? Well, at, uh, of course, China has changed rapidly in the last 30 years. And this sort of a rapid change that China has undergone in 30 years is absolutely unprecedented in the history of the world. Such a rapid economic development in just barely three decades has transformed China. The first visit in June of 1991, I still remember the streets of Beijing were absolutely full of cycles. There was no other means of transport. There were no private cars. Uh, buses, a large number of them, but everybody, phalanxes of cycles, wide roads in China. And today, of course, you don't see China, wide roads and what infrastructure China has created all over the country, especially in terms of civil engineering, roads, bridges, uh, dams, uh, buildings, is absolutely unprecedented. No other country in the world can compete with them. There are more skyscrapers in Chicago, uh, sorry, in Shanghai alone than Chicago, Los Angeles, and what? Not Detroit, I think uh, uh, some other large city of America combined. So, but uh, there are certain aspects of China. Well, this sudden rapid growth uh, in China creates naturally concerns, not just in India, but around the world. We have to see as to what China would do with this uh, very large, accruing, comprehensive national power. One of the main uh, concerns, especially in Indian strategic planners, in the Indian military, is that therefore the China is going to attack India, if not the after tomorrow, uh, well, the day after that. That is not the issue in our relations with China. We have to see as to how best we can accommodate, arrange, and ensure that in our relations with China, we safeguard our security interests and at the same time not undertake a destructive uh, conventional war against one another. In today's world, China, India, Pakistan are nuclear weapon powers. To think of conventional war as a solution to any or many of our problems is a totally wrong perception. We've got to learn to live and deal with each other without resorting to conflict. And there lies the biggest challenge in our relations, not just with China, but also with Pakistan and with several other countries as well. And understanding the real nature and dynamics of China, therefore, becomes, becomes an issue of enormous interest for India. You mentioned that there is a need to accommodate China and that perhaps several military commentators, strategic affairs experts feel that conflict with China is inevitable, as you said, the day after day after tomorrow, if not day after tomorrow. Uh, Many of these commentators also feel that India has accommodated China too much, uh, that while conventional warfare, as you said, will hopefully always be avoided, and I don't think that is the intention of either party, uh, that Chinese aggressiveness needs to be responded to. And for that, they cite whether it is incursions on the border, whether it is uh, Chinese military creep in the South China Sea, whether it is now the frequent entry of submarines into the Indian Ocean, uh, China refusing to recognize officers from Jammu and Kashmir, or you know, protesting at a visit of a senior delegation to Arunachal Pradesh, not giving visas, uh, so on and so forth, right? These are significantly provocative Chinese actions in the minds of some commentators. And they feel that the only reason India has not managed to respond to these effectively is because there's been too much of accommodation of China and it is about time that India asserts her weight, uh, takes a fixed stance and draws certain red lines for China, so to speak. Uh, are you completely in opposition to that view or do you feel that that argument has some merit? No. Uh, in dealing with any country, and not just a major emerging country like China, which is likely to be the leading power in the world, perhaps in the very near future, in several dimensions, not in all dimensions, uh, is not through succumbing, succumbing to the pressures exerted by another, 
but in order to find out the best possible option to deal with those conditions. And the response to many of those challenges is not necessarily the upgradation necessarily only of the military capability and showing red eye to the other side where he does, does not choose to see it makes no impact at all. Or how one best strategizes, develops relations with allies, friends, and therefore prevent the possibility of an adverse action by any opposing side. And so that calls for a great deal of sophistication in our planning, in our preparation, and above all, to identify what is the actual problem. And without being able to do that, we will then be bashing our heads against the wrong wall and only hurting ourselves. So you believe that uh, responding more assertively or aggressively to certain Chinese provocation is not necessarily the right stance right now? Not necessarily the same way that uh, a coercive action has been supposed to have been done by the other side. We can respond by other types of coercive measures. We need to develop other options to check those possibilities. But uh, just to keep shouting that, you know, this is what he has done and that is what he has done and why don't we also attack him head on, that's a total wrong impression. For example, one of the major mistakes that you make is uh, the crossing of the line of actual control. So China has come 20 kilometers this side of the line of actual control. And what has the Indian army been doing so far? Is it sitting on its haunches and allowed the Chinese to come 20 kilometers inside the LSE? This is a normal refrain to find in the media in India, isn't it? <laughs> now, what is the line of actual control? Actual reality is there is no such thing as a line of actual control. Line of actual control should be a line, like the line of control in the India-Pakistan situation is a line finalized by the operational commanders of respective armies sitting down together, large maps in front of them, large scale maps in front of them, and identifying the areas along which the both sides' armies or forces are deployed. Just like the way that international boundaries between countries are formulated over years, decades perhaps, of talks and discussions. There's no such thing that has been done on the line of, on the, on the north, with the, on the border with China. There is no line of actual control. There has been no discussion regarding this. Neither side has yet exchanged maps regarding the, uh, uh, the alignment of our northern borders. So this perception is utterly misguided, utterly provocative utterly without any sense it is to deceive the Indian people. You know, this sort of a articulation serves absolutely no purpose. It, of course, uh, makes my blood boil a bit when I think that, yes, China has crossed 20 kilometers inside India. But in reality, that's wrong. That's a nonsense. And so, therefore, this leads to a certain sense of happening and thinking, which is counterproductive which does not reflect on India's ability to take correct but strong affirmative actions. I, I think there's no doubt that there's a, there's a culture of media-driven hyper-nationalism uh, around many of these issues which, which you were pointing out, that there's a, there's a very easy tendency to get outraged, especially amongst the public, especially in the media, uh, whenever there is any sort of incident on the border. But is it your contention then that China hasn't been making uh, frequent incursions on the border at all? As you said, that the LOAC isn't <coughs> demarcated at all and that therefore it is impossible to say whether China has actually crossed onto the Indian side of the border or not. But if you're saying that it is not much of an issue at all, are you then saying that uh, the Chinese haven't been making any incursions? At all? No, if, uh, I would only say that if we say China has crossed the line of actual control, say, 300 times this year, Chinese can, with equal justification, say that Indian forces have crossed the line of actual control 520 times this year. Both will be correct. 
And so then, where does it get us? When I was deployed in the Sikkim border in 1968, right on the line, so-called, line of what? Actually, Sikkim uh, and China border has been well defined because of a treaty in 1809, I think. Uh, uh, 1809, and so therefore the border is defined, unlike many of the others. But nevertheless, there's a line. When I was deployed on a hilltop in uh, 1968, uh, early, I had to literally go into the Chinese territory and went go into their bunkers. Those times, at the crest line, China was not deployed, but we were. And I used to every morning go on to the other side and did that for several weeks. And uh, nothing uh, particularly uh, sensational about that at all. Uh, I don't think Chinese would have had the uh, opportunity of doing much of that. China was a bit more confident, perhaps, and therefore they did not feel that they needed to be deployed along the line almost uh, every uh, kilometer of the way. Uh, we felt that we needed to, at, at least at certain points, and so we were deployed. And uh, so this sort of a thing keeps happening. So both sides keep crossing at places. Uh, if one side does something, other side does almost the same thing, back again. Uh, the idea is not to reach a situation where actual open hostilities break out, but in both sides, if Indians have taken some actions, Chinese have taken counter actions perhaps, sometimes the Chinese have done a bit more, and sometimes the Indians have done a bit more along the border. But yes, along the India-China border in the north, along the line of actual control, the last serious uh, incident that took place was really in 1975 October. Yes, 1975 uh, 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 October. And I have to be present in that. It's also in our records at a place in Tulungla on the pass in Arunachal Pradesh, Kameng division then of Arunachal Pradesh and uh, at Tulungla. And the Chinese patrol came in and there was a clash with the Assam rifles, if I'm not mistaken, the five Assam rifles. And uh, we lost a few men. I think about eight soldiers uh, died in that encounter. But apart from that, now it's about 40 years, uh, there has been no major uh, exchange of fire or serious confrontation uh, between the two armies. We'll just move on from that and talk a little bit about uh, the nuclear stance of the two countries. Uh, you've gone on record before to speak about nuclear disarmament and point out that China and India uh, share very similar nuclear stances and that there is significant scope for Indo-Chinese cooperation on moving towards uh, a sort of global zero on nuclear disarmament. Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit and speak as to uh, why the traditional Indian leadership role of nuclear disarmament has been given short shrift over the last uh, decade or so? I've been personally uh, uh, involved in conducting uh, nuclear confidence building dialogue trilaterally between India, China and Pakistan simultaneously together these were trilateral dialogues between senior military officers in all three sides at the levels of chiefs of staff sometimes Pakistan, senior generals in China who are dealing spokespersons of China in some of these issues and of course the leading members of the nuclear strategic community in uh, India and uh, all of these none in India unfortunately because of various reasons because of our reluctance to give uh, clearance for Pakistani and Chinese uh, senior people to come and uh, discuss these issues. These meetings had to take place in China, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, somewhere else, and also Dubai, Sri Lanka, etc., Singapore. And we've had elaborate discussions on many of these issues. As you know, uh, China does not yet recognize India as a nuclear weapon power according to the NPT. And so they consider that. Uh, we have been in violation of that and therefore, uh, according to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, India is not in compliance and so therefore India's nuclear weapons capability cannot be officially recognized. As a result, we do not have any official level dialogue between India and China on nuclear issues. There was some talk of uh, commencing that, but it has not yet come about. And so this was an experience where we exchanged the history of our nuclear program, 
the doctrines that each side has followed, the concerns that each side has, the developments in the global nuclear situations, both in terms of um, armaments, uh, new technologies, new strategies, new doctrines that have been com coming about, the whole uh, 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 strategic uh, reduction talks, uh, finally leading up to the new START dialogue, which finally led to uh, an agreement between uh, Russia and the US in stabilizing and reducing slightly the strategic weapons of both sides. We examined that, exchanged our views regarding this, and also discussed, as I said, the whole possibility of global nuclear disarmament. Now, China is one country which has, I think, adopted a fairly sensible nuclear posture. And that has paid it uh, enormous dividends. China developed its nuclear weapons when threatened by the US. As you know, in the last phase of the Korean War, uh, General MacArthur had recommended the use of nuclear weapons against China to President Harry Truman. And that was the reason that Truman sacked Douglas MacArthur. Uh, there were other occasions later uh, in opposite Taiwan, uh, there were exchanges, 1958, and serious uh, possibilities of an escalation to conflict. And so China decided to develop a nuclear weapons. And so they carried out their first nuclear test on 16th of October, 1964. Well before the Nuclear non proliferation Treaty came into existence, so they were legitimate, so-called legitimate nuclear weapon power, uh, from purely from a legalistic point of view. Since then, in the US-Soviet Union confrontation, each side developed an enormous stockpile of nuclear weapons. Uh, possibly Soviet Union a bit more than the US, or something like about 40,000 plus 30,000 nuclear weapons developed by either both sides. Where China, in spite of it going nuclear in 1964, didn't uh, increase the arsenal beyond possibly as per its claims and the claims accepted by the international community generally is about 240 nuclear weapons. So with a mere 240 nuclear weapons against say the Soviet Union's 40,000, uh, US's 35,000, it managed to ensure that neither side dared attack China. So it achieved its uh, strategic objectives of deterring both these much stronger, greater powers compared to it with a minimal arsenal. And that, of course, is what helped China survive the cultural level. Uh, well, Great Leap Forward was before the nuclear weapons explosion, but the, uh, Great Le uh, the cultural revolution, etc. But the Soviet Union collapsed it could no longer match the arms race with US, not only the nuclear weapons, but a whole range of weapons capability. And having devoted too much effort towards the military dimension of its strategic deterrence, Soviet Union collapsed and uh, disappeared. China did not. So in a sense, it demonstrates its uh, sagacity in uh, working out a deterrence capability with minimum expenditure. One policy for which China stands out is right from the beginning, on 16th October itself, test was at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and soon after that, Mao Zedong went on record and said that China will maintain a minimal arsenal, again, it stuck to its word, and it will not be the first to use nuclear weapons against a nuclear weapon power. It will not use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear power and not be the first to use nuclear weapons against a nuclear power. So that defined China's nuclear policy. One can always say that you can always say this and that. Will you always stick to that position? Well, of course, uh, not many countries can say that it would do that, do that all through a long period of history. But in China's case, in over 
50 years of this, uh, there has not been a serious uh, attempt at threatening another country with the use of nuclear weapons. India also has adopted this as the Indian nuclear doctrine. I think we have a nuclear doctrine, which of course is the case of Burman M, one of our leading strategists, uh, devoted his whole life to studying these and other forms of deterrence and was instrumental in, primarily instrumental in formulating the policy. I think stands once again as one of the finest uh, doctrines uh, for nuclear weapons in the current era. And so therefore, if both India and China decide not to use, not to be the first to use nuclear weapons against anybody, and if all countries adopt the same policy, then the possibility of use of nuclear weapons reduces enormously. And if two or more sides accept that this could well be a strategy to adopt, then one could develop policies of inspection, of verification and such things so that one is not violating that principle. And that would make the world much safer. Not that it will make the world totally safe against the use of nuclear weapons, but make it that much more safer. And so therefore that is a policy which is worth thinking about in the world. Along with that is of course the reduction in the nuclear arsenals. You know, there are other utterly insane number of 40,000 nuclear weapons and 30,000 nuclear weapons, a total of 70,000 nuclear weapons with the Soviet Union and the USA is equivalent to 5 to 6 kgs of high explosive for every man and woman in the planet. It would result in the destruction of the world, a world not once, twice or 10 times, but possibly about 30 to 50 times. So it is, is it necessary to have such an enormously high destructive power? Is that the only method of ensuring that nuclear weapons will not be used? So these are very challenging questions. This particular thing, of course, has been accepted. So both USA and the Soviet Union, Russia now, have reduced the arsenals enormously to engaging in the strategic arms reduction talks. And hopefully that makes the world safer. And so perhaps this is one way to go. As you know, there's a global movement towards this, a global zero initiative. Rajiv Gandhi himself uh, announced the plan, Rajiv Gandhi Action Plan in the United Nations in 1988, uh, announcing that we should move towards a world without nuclear weapons and step by step and eliminate all our arsenals. And so these are possibilities, these are options. We are nowhere near that as yet. But as a goal, I think it is definitely worth following. What would your reaction be to, to a much more conservative or a realist stance which would portray the prevalence of nuclear weapons in the world today as the cause for much of the stability in the world today? And from that perspective, uh, the non-escalation of hostilities between India and Pakistan at various times would often be put down to the existence of nuclear weapons which would assure too much of a bloody nose to, or much more than a bloody nose rather to both sides. Uh, similar arguments have been made for example uh, for nuclear weapons in the Middle East that because Israel is the only country uh, with nuclear power it, it is able to be more aggressive than it usually would. We have realist commentators saying that it would not be a bad thing if Iran were to be nuclear armed for the Middle East. You have other nuclear commentators saying that uh, China's aggressive would be much more if it didn't have to contend with the nuclear India and so on and so forth. Uh, what would your response be to that argument? Uh, that the presence of nuclear weapons can be a st stabilizing force and limit aggressiveness on parts of various actors? This is a very highly discussed topic ever since nuclear weapons came into fore and Soviet Union developed its own nuclear weapons within four years of the US nuclear weapons and also developed a hydrogen weapons capability soon after. So the gap between the US 
and the Soviet Union, two principal superpowers at the end of the Second World War, was a very short one. And uh, there was an opportunity for going back to war. And in that context, of course, there's this very strong argument uh, made by many world leaders that the nuclear weapons between both these superpowers during the entire duration of the Cold War maintained global peace. The mutual assured destruction that each side was capable of inflicting on the other side was the biggest deterrence for the other side to think of using its nuclear weapons. Now, this is a very strong uh, argument and there is no way to disprove that argument. And so therefore, this is an <coughs> important issue that needs to be taken on board as well. But the fact is that uh, nuclear weapon is an extremely devastating weapon. It is the, not an artillery which destroys a small portion of uh, a particular area. But it's an it has got the capability of destroying towns, cities. The big bertha of the Soviet Union, the 60 million tons worth of TNT explosive power can destroy a large city uh, by itself and that city will be absolutely incinerated. Now there are so many other risks asso associated with it. For example, the very fact that uh, uh, nuclear weapons could be accidentally used. It could be lost somewhere and uh, then somebody else gets hold of it and uses it for terrorist purposes. Uh, accidents happen. Now these are dangers that are really severe and real. Only the other day, I think three days ago, some Americans, I think, surfing, not surfing, uh, scuba diving off the coast of Canada discovered a 3.5 megaton nuclear bomb in the seabed. This was lost some 40 years ago, I think. And uh, it was there. It had fallen out of a bomber, US bomber aircraft. Fortunately, it fell into the sea and, uh, well, it did not detonate. Now imagine a detonation takes place even accidentally in Soviet Union or Russia now or in the US. And the other side thinks, or the same side thinks that this is an attack by Russia on the US. And then it launches all its nuclear weapons on the other side before Russia can send more nuclear weapons to destroy all of the USA. And so you have a situation of accidental nuclear warfare. So the risks of an exchange of nuclear weapons becomes so high, though it's very unlikely to happen, but should it happen, it has the potential to destroy the world as we know it today. So these are high risk situations and world has to seriously take into account whether we should accept that, well, things have still going on, the world exists, and perhaps will exist for a few thousand years more, uh, or perhaps the chances of it uh, exploding is too high to come contemplate. I want to talk a little bit about the impact of the recent change in government in Sri Lanka. Uh, the new administration which has come in uh, has been perceived to be significantly more pro-India uh, than the previous administration. Uh, something that really pleased policymakers in Delhi was the suspension of the $1.4 billion contract which had been awarded to China for the Colombo port. Uh, but at the same time, there have been several comments made uh, by the Prime Minister and by senior cabinet ministers which refer to things like the right to shoot Indian fishermen, uh, which raised the issue of uh, human rights violations by the IPKF in response to inquiries uh, over human rights violations in the recently concluded uh, war against the LTTE. Uh, I, th I believe the power minister also spoke about how India cannot tell uh, Sri Lanka what its China policy should be. So there have been some conflicting signals uh, from the Sri Lankan administration. On one hand, they've definitely taken some steps uh, which, which India has appreciated. And on the other hand, there have been st statements made by the power minister, by the, by the prime minister himself, uh, 
which had a much more contrasting tone. Uh, how do you analyze these developments and do you believe that the, the change in power has, uh, has set us on a much more positive note vis-a-vis -vis Sri Lanka? You know, I would always be very suspicious of somebody uh, who claims to be pro-India. No political leader, especially in a democratically elected government, can be anything but pro his country. He will always pursue the policy which is in the best interest of his country, as he sees it. And of course, as to how he sees it and somebody else sees it, there would be a difference. And so therefore, let it be absolutely clear that uh, what uh, the previous president, Mr. Rajapaksha, did and what uh, Mr. Matripola uh, Sirisena will do is entirely pro-Sri Lanka. There is nothing else but that. And they, of course, they cannot go and do anything. If they are seen to be that, of course, they will not remain in power democratically. I think uh, Mr. Rajapaksha was making some serious mistakes and uh, through which I think he alienated his own people and uh, over dependence on Chinese uh, financial assistance, support for development and some of these projects are really very competent, very good and uh, will of course lead to economic development of Sri Lanka. But these are all loans, long term loans, low interest loans, but ne nevertheless there is a lot of corruption involved in that and also some of these were more than what could perhaps uh, be desirable for the good of Sri Lanka itself. And so the opposition played up on it and the, entire, the corruption in the uh, presence and his family, extended family, that was exposed. And he was so confident that he called for elections two years before his term was to end because he thought he was so successful in winning the war against the Tamils. Uh, the Sri Lankan people will be beholden to him and elect him again with a very high majority. And that proved to be a disillusionment for him. And the reasons were some of these things. And so, even Matsupala Sirisena uh, will not be entirely pro-India. He will look at many of these possibilities. I personally feel that on the Sri Lankan project, it is a very advantageous project overall for Sri Lanka. Uh, for Sri Lanka. Massive investment, manage, massive construction by China. I've been along the highway from uh, Colombo to Gaul. It's a superb, superb highway. Uh, uh, nothing like that really quite exists in many parts of even India. And so it's a great advantage to it. And uh, the Sri Lankan economy is picking up largely because of the Sri Lankan Chinese aid and development of infrastructure. Uh, but the port project, I think, was excessive. Uh, even though Hamadota port, how far useful it will be, uh, is debatable. It was uh, Mr. Rajapaksha's constituency, such enormous expenditure in his constituency in the port, plus the international airfield at uh, Gaul, uh, it naturally gives a tremendous boost to his personal popularity in that region. And he and his uh, progeny will continue to get elected from that part of Sri Lanka, southern Sri Lanka, for several rounds more. But the, the Colombo port uh, probably is not best uh, developed as an idea. And the possibility of one part of that deal was to be made available to China in perpetuity. A small part which could perhaps have been developed for several reasons, including perhaps a submarine port or something that gave high concern to a lot of people, including the Sri Lankans themselves. So this is a correction in that sense. But Matripala Sirisana visited China. All those projects are back on. The Colombo project will take off, notwithstanding what we say. We will also collaborate with China, perhaps, in developing the northern part of Sri Lanka, many of the infrastructure requirements. And Sri Lanka <coughs> will manage to get the best deal for itself, both from China and from India. On the question of uh, power, of course, China's power projects are extremely successful and uh, we will also provide, develop a power project in the north. They are already more or less 
The moment uh, 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 Chinese Xi Jinping visited China and inaugurated the power point, a power plant in the north of Sri Lanka, the same day the president of Sri Lanka announced a reduction in electricity tariff by 25 percent. I've lived in Sri Lanka when there was a nationwide power cut, eight hours each. The whole island was divided into eight parts and there used to be eight hour power cut for each of those three parts. And I happened to live in a particular place where one side had the morning power cut and the other side had an evening power cut. So I could jump from one place to the other and avoid the power cut. But that was the state and today Sri Lanka is power surplus. We will also provide power support to it, growing rapidly, industrially as well as commercially. And uh, Sri Lanka will benefit out of that. The major issue regarding the uh, fishing in the waters around Sri Lanka, uh, the area, has, the maritime area has been demarcated. There are major problems. It's not that uh, India is always wrong and Sri Lanka is always, always right or vice versa. Our fishermen are not always right. The reality is that that part of uh, the ocean has been overfished. And so therefore, our fishermen from Tamil Nadu do not find sufficient fish in our part of the ocean. And quite often, they go on to the other side. And perhaps a similar thing happens elsewhere. We have to change our fishing habit, fishing culture. Our fishermen have to be provided much more money. They have to go into the deep sea where the fish are dying of old age. And the Taiwanese fishermen are coming in huge trawlers followed by support ships. You catch the ship, you process the ship, process, process the ship and cut them up and things like that and send them straight to market. And we have to adopt those postures. And then of course, if you go on to the deep water this thing and have a better understanding, we can resolve this issue. It is a big human uh, tragedy. Uh, affects people of both sides and this can be very easily avoided. Major General Banerjee, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wind up this chat today, but it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for being with us and I hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.